and we specialize in her energy, her beauty, and her style. Now, my um, the reason why I am taking you on this journey of the birth of her smile is that we live every day. You and I, everybody, we live every day and we don't know what lies ahead. We plan, we think, we are excited, we're positive, we do our thing, but we don't know what lies ahead. And 10 years ago, if you had said to me that I was running a business with my daughter called Her Smile, I wouldn't have believed you. If you had said to me that I was running a ballet school with my daughter, that would have been a different story. But to be running a business called Her Smile, where we specialized in fitness, beauty, and styling, I wouldn't have believed you. Right. So I just thought, you know, you I'm posting every day about what we believe in, and that is what you eat, think, do, and wear. Um, but we, you know, if you're not if you're not commenting or liking or or giving any feedback, we don't even know if you're reading the posts. So I just thought, you don't know anything about me or my daughter or her smile. And um, in fact, I, don't th I think my daughter learned a thing or two when she was preparing these slides about me. So where did her smile begin? And now don't worry, this isn't going to take you long. This is part one. And we're just going to start with where it all began. And well, that began with me. I was born in a country called Rhodesia, which is now called Zimbabwe. Okay. And um, I was born in 1962 to a to a, a father who was an accountant um, and he was also a boxing um, trainer and he um, trained the boys and the men to the Olympics in the 50s and 60s with his boxing club that he owned and that's him there on the right okay and I used to go along with him this country is Rhodesia but it's now called Zimbabwe and um, I used to go along as you know his daughter my my brother, who was two years older than me, was training in the gym with my dad. So I would go along and just be put in the corner because I was female, made to sit there and watch the boys training. And I always used to wish I could participate. I loved what they were doing. And so I was brought up in, up in a home where my father was fitness fanatic. And he was really hard on my brother and made him really, really work hard. Okay, so um, at the age of four, apparently, I um, begged my mother to send me to ballet. Now, they don't know why or where, or where I heard about ballet, because in the 60s, there was no television or very little television in Rhodesia. And so they're not sure where I heard about it. But anyway, I was taken to ballet lessons, and there I am. And I, um, at the tender age of four, five years, I was entered into the first I Stetford, and in that first I Stetford, I managed to win my category, and there I am with my little trophy. And so I continued to do ballet, and then I added um, jazz and tap. I was allowed to continue and do jazz and tap as well. And um, so at the age of 12, I participated in the I Stetford, um, I think all the years, but then I participated participated again and there I am with the trophies that I won for best in my categories or um, in ballet, jazz, tap and it was a very exciting time. Um, a, um, a year later the Rhodesian National Ballet was putting on the Nutcracker and every year they brought out a ballet mistress. This particular year um, they brought out June Mitchell from the Royal Ballet in London. And she was our ballet mistress, for, well, was the ballet mistress for the Royal Ballet, uh, the Rhodesia National Ballet for the year. She sent out an audition notice to, to all the country and said that she would be putting on the Nutcracker and she would like all the little children to audition. So my ballet teacher sent us along and said to me that I could go along and audition. I could end up being a rat or a soldier or something in this product production. As it turns out, I got the lead of Clara, which was very, very exciting and um, a surprise to us all. And from that, I was seen by talent scouts and I got the lead in a television commercial for toothpaste. <laughs> so that was me growing up. Here I am. You'll see me on the, the um, left. There I am. And I am. That was me performing in one as in the jazz section of where you saw me winning the trophies that was me performing in the jazz section and I remember in that actual performance it was a solo and when I was finished the adjudicator at the Art Stedford she um, sent a message backstage that I must please come back on stage and perform the whole dance again 
And I was absolutely devastated. And she had said it was because the music had been of poor quality and she felt it wasn't fair on me. So um, I performed the whole thing again. But fortunately, I um, obviously went on and impressed her and got the trophy. The middle picture in the screen is me going to my um, best friend's house to have my hair done. And it was done by her older sister. And that was where I met my husband. So I, those two women are now my sisters-in-laws. Um, and then, then to the right, when I was 17, I had opened my own ballet school and was running it um, while I was still at school. So I went to school in the day and then I ran my ballet school in the afternoons. And then I went to my own classes in the evenings where I was doing my teacher's exams and my final dancing exams. Excuse me. I was also a childhood model in the 60s, the late 60s, wearing the minis and the maxis. And um, at the age of 17, I was in the professional musical theater production of My Fair Lady. So I was still at school, but um, we toured the country with that production. It was phenomenal. And then down below, you'll see me running there. Um, I used to run first in the junior athletics. So I loved fitness. When I left school, my father was very concerned that I was going into the dancing industry. So he insisted that I do some other form of qualification. Our universities at that time were um, uh, unstable, as you will learn. And so I did a beauty specialist diploma because I thought that that would be really good for learning how to do makeup correctly for stage and things like that. And I managed to win student of the year. Now, as I said, Rhodesia was at war right from when I was the age of two until I was 17. Unfortunately, what this meant was that all the men here, you'll see this is my dad and this is my boyfriend who is now my husband and my brother, but there's no image of my brother. And they were conscripted six weeks in, six weeks out to go and fight in the war. And um, that was just normal for us. This is what we lived with. And here on the bottom screen, you'll see that this is now our petrol, petrol depot in the main city, the capital, called Salisbury, and it was bombed. And I remember that happening and us running outside and actually watching the flames at night. It was quite spectacular. And so Rhodesia was sanctioned by the rest of the world. There was no import net export and there were shortages of everything. So you would just see the sign outside the petrol station. There was no petrol. Everybody was rationed with little coupons that we had to carry. And then when we heard that the, the um, station, petrol stations would let us know when there was, um, get, they were going to get a fuel delivery. And then when people would start to queue. And they would queue and queue and queue and queue and queue down the road, okay, and round the corner and miles and miles. And that's where they would, we would sit for days waiting for hope for the petrol to be delivered. Um, the petrol would be delivered and then we had these coupons. So they weren't allowed a fill out tank. They had to only give us a month of coupon that allocated to us for the month. And so this is how they would work through the vehicles and fill the, um, give them all their allocation of fuel. And if you were at the back and this petrol station ran out of fuel before they got to you, that was just how it worked. It was very unfortunate and a very stressful time to live. But we lived. That was life. That's what we knew from, I knew from the age of two until 17. It was life. All we knew. We used to queue for everything, for bread, for everything. Okay. If you wanted to go on holiday in that time during the wars, that was the 60s and the 70s, um, you couldn't just get in your car and drive because it was a bush war. The fighters would be waiting for you outside the cities. So what they did was um, they created convoys. So if you were going away on holiday and you needed to leave your city, um, we actually found it a lot of fun. You would get up and then go and it... 5 a.m., 5.30 a.m., you would be standing there drinking your cups of coffee, and then there would be a briefing with the police and the military. They would give us all, well, the parents and the drivers, um, um, a briefing. Everyone would get in their cars, and then they would escort us. So the military escorted us in the front, in the middle, behind. You can see the trucks here, um, and you can see us all in the convoy sitting there waiting, and um, there would be helicopters flying overhead. Sorry. That's really brought back some memories. And so there would be helicopters flying overhead. I wasn't expecting to do that. And um, it was quite a, a scary time. And this is my husband here. If we decided he was my boyfriend then, there's my mom in the background, my dad, my uh, my me and my sister. And then if we wanted to get out the car, we would go to the toilet or go and sightsee something, then we'd have to have rifles with us for protection. So this is what was the norm for us. 
Anyway, eventually this got too much for me and I left school and I married my childhood sweetheart, my husband now, and my boyfriend then, and we immigrated to South Africa. So I was forced to leave my country of birth and we immigrated to South Africa and um, that's where I opened my ballet school. Sorry, and I ran that from the from 1985 until 2002. So we got married in 1981, we immigrated in 1983, and I opened a ballet school in 1985, just finding my, my feet. And there we stayed. And um, I ran my ballet school, and it was a very, very happy time for us. And um, put on many productions, and the parents were fantastic. If you look down here at the bottom screen, um, the one wonderful woman, um, Mrs. Farrell, she painted the backdrop for our... Um, Beauty and the Beast production, and we did many other productions, and it was a very, very happy place. And this is where we had our two children. We had Kirsten in 1990 and Brian in 95, and um, they were very carefully planned. And um, then we just saw the writing on the world, war, writing on the wall with the country that we were living in, South Africa. It had become violent, and it was um, not a happy place and a safe place to raise children. And so we immigrated to Australia in 2002. I managed to get in um, as a ballet teacher and I came as a ballet teacher. Now, I have to say this was now the third country I was living in. I wasn't sure where I belonged anymore. And it was a very stressful time, leaving all our family, all our support, my parents. We were very close with them. And we landed in Australia, and we were very excited and very relieved to be here and to bring our small children with us. Um, there they arrived with our crate of stuff. We camped in a, in a house for three months while we waited for our stuff to be delivered, and then it was delivered, and um, that was a very exciting time. But I was an absolute emotional and physical wreck. Okay, I wasn't running my own ballet school. I was being, I was in a complete, I was in, everything was different. The bread was different. The way you put petrol in was different. Um, the way ballet was performed was different. Everything was different. I was completely out of my comfort zone. We had no support, absolutely no support here in the way of caring, loving family and friends like we had had back home. We'd been very safe and secure and well loved. And um, so it was a very difficult time and I just fell apart. And after two or three years of teaching for other people, um, I can't remember, two, three or four, five years of teaching, I left the ballet industry completely. And I refreshed that qualification that you saw me do in 1981, where I was student of the year. I went here in Canberra and I refreshed my qualification and then I started to work my skills. And I'd known ballet all my life for 39 years. Now I was 43 and I was, so I started ballet when I was four. So now for 39 years I'd known the ballet industry and now I was a beauty therapist. And I was working my skills and working my skills and working my skills and it was completely new to me. And in that journey, I had to fix my skin. Um, in the immigration and all the stress, I had developed terrible, terrible adult acne and I looked terrible. And I had aged enormously from all the stress, emotional stress, and I was a mess. And so I slowly started to put myself back together. And so I opened the studio and that was from home and I felt safe at home. And I just worked it and worked it and worked all the skills. What I then discovered was a skincare range that really, really worked and delivered. I noticed how my skin started to heal beautifully. And you'll see here at the bottom left, um, one of my cl clients, her skin healing beautifully. And I have had the most amazing results with my clients and their skin. But in, I am a walking testimonial of skincare and with this particular skincare range. And um, so no surprise to me that for 2018, 19 and 20, they have one best medical skincare in the world. And they, it was in red lights in Times Square in New York. And I um, have learned so much from this doctor, Dr. Fernandes, who is the founder of the product and um, have done been with them 15 years. And so my clients have done the journey with me and we've got some amazing results from them. And so I was starting to feel better. I was starting to reinvent myself. I was starting to heal. And so you can understand my journey of understanding where you're at because I've been there 
I've been there, felt the pain, done the journey. Um, and so now what happened next? Well, my business was back to back, flat out for six days a week until the global financial crisis hit. And what was I going to do next? Because now I was going flat out, full blast, and suddenly it crashed like everyone else's businesses, and we went down to 30%. So I lost 70% of my business. So what did I do next? Well, like I said to you right in the beginning, we don't know what's happening in our life. We don't what, know what, what lies ahead. And then the global financial crisis was a crisis. Nobody knew that the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, would lay ahead. None of us know what lies ahead. And so what did I do next? Well, You'd have to tune in this time next week because I'm not going to take up any of more of your time. And I'm grateful for the time you've given me. But I just thought that I would share with you that, you know, if you know I'm human, I've done a journey too of pain and um, all the things, emotional stress, not knowing who I am, not knowing my identity. I had put 30% of myself together here by now, 2007, 2008, from completely wiping the slate clean, I now had 30% of myself and I was doing well. I was starting to feel strong, but what did I do next? And that's what I want you to tune in for next week.